The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars to you and your family. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Jewel-Laden Jockey. There are those among us who see stories in their daily newspapers about new crimes which have just been committed and who conveniently skip over those items because crime is unpleasant and affords them no escape from reality. It is not important that you read every article about every criminal, but it is important that you, as a citizen, be cognizant of the current situation, that you be acquainted with some of the shocking facts about the crime wave. Those facts, like the one which tells you that there are 36 murders committed every day in this country, are vital to you because if enough of your fellow citizens learn them, they will act. They will see to it that your local police force is given the weapons it needs to fight the crime wave and to fight it to a successful and speedy conclusion. Tonight's file opens at a small half-mile racetrack in a Midwestern state. Pop Campbell, one of the trainers, is standing at the rail with his daughter Betty. It is 6.30 in the morning, just getting light, but already there are horses on the track getting their morning workout. That's Jupiter's boy, isn't it, Pop? Yeah. I caught him in 52 flat. Ah, uh, he's the one to beat this afternoon. Nah, we can beat him if Scotty gets here to ride. Wonder what happened to Scotty. He's never done this before. He knew Black World was going today. Hmm, Pop. Hmm? Whitey's waiting for you. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, Whitey! Let him run! He's letting him out. Yeah, honey, I, I, I told him to. Doesn't look like that ankle's bothering him at all. No. No, I think it's going to be okay. I hope so. Excuse me. Uh, uh, uh-huh. Yeah? You, Pop Campbell? Uh-huh. I'm a friend of Scotty's. Well, uh... He ain't around. Yeah, yeah, I know. You brought his tack bag here, didn't you? Well, yeah, that's right. He wants me to pick it up. What for? I don't know what for. He just said he wanted me to pick up his tack bag from Pop Campbell. Where is Scotty? In town. Did he give you a note? He said I wouldn't need a note. You do before you get the bag from me. Now, look, Pop. Go away, mister. Go away. I'm busy. I'm busy. Okay. I'll go. But I'll be back. Hmm? He just worked in 51-4, breathing. Yeah. Well, aren't you pleased? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, honey. I've just been thinking about something else. That man who wanted Scotty's bag? Yeah. I was just wondering what could be in that bag that made him want it so much. <laughs> Later that morning, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bruce Bedford. Hi, Bruce. Oh, hello, Jim. Boss just called, said I should check with you. Yeah, he wants us to work together on this case that just came in. Hmm? What is it? Well, so far as we know, it's murder. Where did it happen? On the train from Chicago sometime last night. Hmm. How much do we know? 
Oh, enough to start on, but not enough to get very far with. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah. Who was killed? A man named Richard Scott. He was a jockey. At one time, he rode at some of the big tracks, but he's ridden mostly at county fairs and half-mile tracks around this part of the country. I see. Whoever killed him probably used a silencer on his gun because the porter claims he never heard any shot fired. Mm -hmm. When was the body discovered? This morning in his compartment. It's a little odd for a small-time jockey like that to travel in a compartment. Scott liked to live as well as he could, according to what I found out so far. Well, why was this office given the case? Because Scott was en route to the city. Mm. Probably to ride out of Whitman Park. Racing starts out there today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's probably where he was headed. Anything else in the report on Scott? Yes, his bag was rifled and his clothes were scattered all over the compartment. There was an address book found in Scott's clothes that may prove to be an interesting collection of names. Why? Well, two of the names were people here in town, and both of them are suspected by the police of being fences with stolen jewelry. Oh, how about the other names from out of town? They're being checked now. Mm-hmm. How about the bullet that killed Scott? Was shot from a thirty-eight. It's being checked at the unidentified ammunition file right now. Bruce, as soon as we get a report from either source, we'll go to work. Quiet, boy. Quiet now. Come on. Come on. Stand still. <laughs> he hated to be combed. If he only knew how pretty it made him. Well, I hope he looks this pretty this afternoon. Ah, he will, Pop. He's going to win us a nice purse, aren't you, boy? <laughs> Golden image goes tomorrow. How far? Six. She don't seem to like to win at six. Oh, I think maybe against these horses down here, she'll she'll do better. If we win a purse, maybe we can claim another horse, huh? Well, honey, we can't carry more than two in the van unless we move our stuff out. I'd like to claim Jupiter's boy. I think we could do something with that horse. Well, Radford knows his business, honey. If he's dropping his horse in that kind of a race, he... Say, that's Golden Image. What's the matter with her? Well, it sounds like there's somebody in her stall. Somebody she don't know. I'll go see. Well, wait, I'll come with you. Yeah. I'm going after him. No, 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 Betty. Come back here. But, Pop, maybe he stole something. I don't care if he did. I don't want you getting hurt. Now, come on back here. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh, steady. Come on. Steady now. Steady. Come on. Steady, boy. Uh. Well, don't look like he harmed golden image. None anyway. Oh, take it easy. Pop, look. Huh? In the corner. Scotty's tax bag. Yeah. Stuff spread all over the floor. Pop, let's tell the police about this. Yeah. yeah, I think I will. Jim, uh, did you get anything back yet on your queries? Yes, I just got the report back on Scott's address book. Oh, uh, what about those names of Monta? Huh? Almost every one of them is a suspected fence. Hmm. Sounds like Scott was mixed up in something more than horse racing. Mm. In fact, we know he was. One of the suspected fences admitted that Scott worked with him. And what was his job? Well, Scott used to be the messenger for a whole flock of dealers in stolen jewelry. It was easy for him to carry it without suspicion. Well, that establishes the motive for the murder, then. Yeah, the killer undoubtedly knew that Scott was carrying some jewelry to deliver to someone here in the city. Now, how about checking those two names that were in the book from here in town? Oh, I just finished talking to them. Huh? They both admitted knowing Scott, but denied that they were expecting him to bring anything to them. Mm-hmm. Scott was traveling with only one bag. I, I wonder where the rest of his stuff is. Oh, I called the Ritchie State Fairgrounds where Scott rode last week. They checked on that for me. Uh, what'd they find? Well, Scott ordinarily traveled with a man named Pop Campbell and his daughter Betty. Yeah, who are they? Campbell's what they call a gypsy around the racetracks. He owns two horses, trains them himself, hmm. and lives on whatever the horses win. I see. Now, Scott was his jockey. Ordinarily, the three of them travel together right with the horses. Now, this time, Scott came by train. I wonder why. I don't know, Bruce. But we can find that out easily enough. Let's go out to Whitman Park and talk to Pop Campbell. <laughs> Pretty interesting back here. I've never been behind the scenes at a racetrack. See those horses? They're walking around over there? Yeah. They're cooling them off. They've already raced this afternoon. <laughs> kind of like unwinding them? Yeah, that's about it. Oh, well, that's table 423 over there, Jim, where that girl is standing. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Hello there. Hello. My name is Taylor. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Okay. This is Special Agent Bedford. I'm Betty Campbell. How do you do? You're Pop Campbell's daughter? That's right. Is your father here? No, he's not. Uh, do you know where we might reach him? No. He went into town. I expect him back soon, though, if you want to stick around. Well? Is it about that man this morning? What man, Miss Campbell? The man who tried to steal something from the stable. No, no. As a matter of fact, we didn't know anything about that. We wanted to ask him a few questions about a jockey named Richard Scott. Uh, maybe you can help us, Miss Campbell. Sure, I'll try. I know Scotty pretty well. Is he in trouble? He was killed last night. What? I'm... I'm sorry to have to break the news to you this way. How did it happen? We don't know all the details yet ourselves, Miss Campbell. How can we help you, Mr. Taylor? Well, the first thing Mr. Bedford and I would like to do is take a look at that tack bag that Scotty shipped down here in your van. Sure. It's right inside that door. That's what the man who broke in was looking through, and we scared him away. Oh? Here you are, Mr. Taylor. The bag is... Well, what's the matter, Miss Campbell? The bag? Yes? It's gone. <laughs> Is Scotty here? You, Pop Campbell? Yeah, that's right. I got his message asking me to come by here. Come on in. Thank you. He'll be with you in a minute. Tell him I'm in a hurry. I got to get back to the track. Hello, Pop. Hmm? I said hello. Yeah, you're the man who was at the track this morning. Yeah, that's right. What are you doing here? I live here. But I got a message from Scotty to bring his tech bag here. Me and my partner here left that message for you. Oh, I get it. Well, I still ain't giving you this bag. We don't want it anymore. We've already gone through the bag, Pop. So you're the one who was at the stable this morning? Yeah. We didn't find what we wanted. That's why we had you come here. What were you looking for? Scotty had a package in that bag, and we think you know where it is. I never looked in Scotty's tack bag in my life. How would I know? Look, Pop, uh, take my advice, huh? You'd better tell us what we want to know. It'll work out nicer for you. How can I tell you what I don't know myself? Now, look, Pop. Johnny, let me handle this. Where's the package, Pop? I told you, I don't know. You're a liar. <coughs> no. uh. Let him get up by himself, Johnny. Maybe now he'll remember. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now an important message about social security, your social security. Do you know how to get the most out of it? Do you know what steps you should take to safeguard your rights? A great many people don't. That's why the Equitable Society offers all listeners to this program, without charge, a special service on social security consisting of three steps. First step, full information. When you have a question about Social Security, put it up to your Equitable Society representative. He knows the answer. For instance, you may be surprised to learn that a person doesn't have to be 65 to be eligible for benefits, or that your rights under Social Security may be worth from twelve dollars to $18,000, depending on your age, salary, and other factors. Why be ill-informed or misinformed about such a valuable asset? Get all the facts. See your Equitable representative. Second step... An immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. In any account, there's always danger of mistakes being made, and some of them cannot be corrected after four years. To protect your rights, the Social Security Administration advises you to make regular checkups on your account. The simple way to do this is to get a special form from your equitable representative, a form approved by the Social Security Administration. This checkup is doubly important because after you've made it, you're ready to profit from the final step of this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. 
He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no charge for this service, so see your Equitable Society representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Jewel-Laden Jockey. With a murder taking place every half hour, day and night, throughout the year, there are of necessity a variety of motives which lead to the crime. Some murders are committed because of an overwhelming desire for revenge, or a temporary emotional instability, or sheer unadulterated hatred of people. None of those murders can be condoned. But of the different classifications, the most socially reprehensible is the venal murder, the killing of a fellow man for profit, such as the murder in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Those murders are the most difficult to solve because they are usually committed by professional criminals who take pains to cover up their tracks. Sometimes they cover up so well that it seems for a while that they will be successful, as if they will escape without paying their just debt to society. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Bruce, we got a break on that Scott murder while you were on. Oh, good. What happened? The Chicago police picked up a jewel thief named Paul Harrison. Eric, how does he fit into this picture, Jim? Well, he was supposed to meet Scott yesterday at the railroad station in Chicago and give him some jewelry to bring here. Oh. But Harrison missed the train. And the Chicago police picked him up. Yeah, that's right. Now, Scott stayed on the train when he left the station, undoubtedly thinking that Harrison was aboard. Mm-hmm. Then, when he heard a knock on his compartment door, he probably opened it, thinking that it was Harrison. Yes, that sounds like what happened, Jim. Whoever it was who killed Scott certainly knew in advance he was supposed to be carrying those jewels. Yeah, yeah, this was a double cross of some kind, I think. Uh, was all the jewelry recovered with Harrison's arrest? Yes, every bit of it. But that doesn't end our job in this case, Bruce. Even though Scott was mixed up in crime, we've still got to find his killer. <laughs> He's out, Al. He ain't gonna stay out. Give me that glass of water on the table. Uh, Come on, Pop. Come around. uh, Get with it, will you? Al, let me take over for a while, huh? Uh, Okay. Pop. Pop, are you waking up now to hear me? Uh, Yeah. Then listen to me, huh? I don't like to see Al keep hitting you. But we gotta find out where that package is. I told you, ask Scotty. He'll tell you he never gave me any package. We can't ask Scotty, Pop. He's dead. What? He had an accident on the train. What happened to him? Take one guess. Oh. Now, you wouldn't want the same thing to happen to you, would you? No, no. Now, look, Pop. You train horses for a living, right? Yeah. Okay, we do this for a living. You don't like your job to be any tougher than it has to be, so neither do we. Now, why don't you stop all this and tell us where the package is? I don't know. Why do you keep saying I don't know? Because it's true. Look, Johnny, let me start again. It's up to you, Pop. Do you want him to? How can I tell you what I don't know? Okay, I'll go to work again. Jim, I just finished making a half a dozen phone calls trying to find some of Scott's close friends. Good. Maybe we can get a lead from one of them. Oh, Miss Campbell's on her way in here. Maybe she's got some news. What's she doing here? I don't know, Bruce. The receptionist just called in, asked if it was all right to send her in. I think we ought to go back to the track, Jim. Why? You got some kind of a lead out there? No, but maybe some of those jockeys can give us some dope on Scott, huh? Yeah. I don't seem to be able to locate anybody who knows much about him. May I well, come if we... in, Mr. Taylor? Oh, yes, Miss Campbell, please oh, do. Hello there. Hi. Mr. Taylor... I think Pop's in trouble. Why? What's happened? 
Black World, one of our horses, was in the fourth race and Pop didn't show up. Oh. After the race, I went looking for him. Does he always stay at the track during the races? Sure, when we have a horse running, he does. I looked all over for him, and finally in the kitchen where all the horse people eat, I got Pop's message. What message was that? He told the man behind the counter to tell me that he'd be back in time for the race. That was after we spoke to you, wasn't it? That's right. Well, he might have just been delayed someplace. I wouldn't be too concerned. But the counter man told me that Pop said he was going to meet Scotty. He what? You see? He didn't know that Scotty had been killed. Bruce, it sounds like a trap to get him into town. Yeah. Miss Campbell, do you have any idea where he might have gone when he left the track? Yes, he got a lift with George Barrow. Who? He's a trainer. He's got a public stable. Oh, I see. And did uh, Barrow return to the track? Yes. I asked him where Pop was, and he said that he let him out at Main and 7th, and that Pop said he was going to catch a streetcar from there. Main and 7th. But Barrow didn't see what streetcar your father took, did he? No. Seems to me the first thing we've got to do is find out who we're looking for. Bruce, now, suppose you take Miss Campbell with you and go on down to police headquarters. Right. Who is for, Mr. Taylor? Oh, Mr. Bedford will help you look through their file of pictures and see if you can pick out the man who came to see you. Uh, I'm going out to the track, Bruce. I'll meet the two of you out there. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Bruce. Where's Miss Campbell? She's pretty shaken, Jim, so I took her over to their van. She promised she'd try to get a little rest. No, I swear. She identified the man who came out here this morning. Oh, no, who is it? Al Edwards. Edwards, Edwards. I remember him, but I thought he was doing time. So did the police, but we checked, and he's out on parole. Oh. Another one of those, huh? Yeah. How did you make out? Well, I'm waiting now to talk to that counterman that Miss Campbell told us about. The one who knew Pop was going to meet Scotty. Yeah, that's him. He's coming down to see me as soon as they can locate him. Bruce. Hmm? Miss Campbell made a positive identification on Edwards, didn't she? I mean, there's no chance of her being wrong. None at all, Jim. Mr. Taylor? Well, yes, that's right. I'm the counterman that Pop Campbell talked to. Oh, good. Uh, did you hear him say where he was going by any chance? Oh, he said he was going to meet Scotty. Hmm? Where? Well, I think I heard him say uh, 711 Wyoming. 711 Wyoming. Yeah, I remember the number because it's so easy. Yeah, well, you wouldn't remember whether that was Wyoming Avenue or Wyoming Street, would you? No, sir, that's, that's all I remember. There's also a Wyoming place up on the north side, Jim. Well, that's right, there is. Well, the only thing we can do is check all three. Oh, thanks very much, sir. You're welcome. Come on, Bruce, let's go. Well, check this one off, Bruce. No luck, huh? No, Dr. Logan lives in this house. Suppose we try 7-Eleven Wyoming Street now. That's right in the neighborhood, isn't it? That's right. Okay, let's go. Wyoming Street isn't the answer either, Bruce. Who lives in this house? 20 women. It's a girls' boarding house. Well, that doesn't leave us much choice. That's right. Wyoming Place is the only other possibility. Come on. Bruce, this can't be the right place either. It's a minister's home. Well, it's not Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, or Wyoming Place. But it has to be an address, doesn't it, Jim? Yes, I should think so. But... Hey, wait a minute, Bruce. Why didn't we think of this before? Head back into town. <laughs> I should bring the old guy around again, Johnny. Oh, just let him stay where he is. But he can't tell us nothing while he's out. I don't think he knows, Al. I think he's leveling with us. If he knew, he'd have talked by now. You mean we did all this for nothing? Well, well, that's the way it goes. You win one, you lose one. I ain't win one in six months now. Don't let it get you down. We'll get lucky with something else. What do we do now? Blow? Not yet. Why not? We can't just walk out and leave the old guy the way he is. He won't come to for a couple of hours yet. But when he does, he goes right to the cops. So what? We'll be gone by then. I, uh, just as soon we had more start than that. Oh. I took the silencer off my gun. Put it back on. It's Jan. And forget the silencer. You'll hear it all over the hotel. In this trap, Al, it'll sound like sweet music. Yeah. Uh, just look out in the hall. See if it's empty. Okay. Well, stay right where you are. Uh, Drop that gun, Edwards. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here. You better call the doctor, Bruce. Campbell looks like he's taking a bad beating. Okay, Jim. Well, we'll take these two downtown and book them. You got nothing on us? Nothing but the murder of Richard Scott. They're just guessing, Al. The 
Whoever on the train that Scott was killed on can identify both of you. When he does, you'll take another train ride. This time, the government will buy your tickets. Al Edwards and his companion, Johnny Russell, were convicted in federal court for theft from interstate shipment. They were given long prison sentences, then turned over to a local court for prosecution for the murder of Richard Scott. The idea which came to Special Agent Taylor after he and Agent Bedford had failed to locate the wanted criminals at Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, and Wyoming Place was that there was a Wyoming hotel and that 7-Eleven Wyoming could mean room 7-Eleven. When that proved to be correct, the case was closed. And thus, another murder was prevented by the quick, thorough work of your FBI. This case was opened and closed within a period of 15 hours, from 9 o'clock one morning to midnight that evening. Some cases work out that way. Others drag on, and the development of clues sometimes takes months and even years. But no matter how long a period elapses, your FBI stays on the job until a clerk in the records section takes a rubber stamp and marks the file. Marks it convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with the special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of this special service offered without charge by your Equitable Representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A behind-the-scenes glimpse into the home life of a hold-up man. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Henpecked Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpeck Hijacker on This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.